We're helpless right now. The shooting was coming from the cafeteria. I heard people running down my hallway screaming. And we moved a piano in front of the door. Oh, We're okay, I love you. What we know right now, we suspect one gunman. I heard shots fired in the cafeteria. So that we turned off all the lights in my class. He didn't say anything the entire time. He took one shot. I heard someone go behind me get down, and I heard a bunch of shots. All of our high school students are now safe, and he is in custody. To turn himself in. We now know that five people were shot. Right now, with a student who's been reunited with a parent. Oh, I was terrified. I'm just happy my little grandson is okay. I just, I want to know. I just want my daughter out of the building. If you haven't hugged or kissed your kid in the last couple days, you take that time. Good evening, I'm Russ Mitchell at Charton High School. You're watching Channel 3 News at 6, part of our continuous coverage of a shooting today at Chardon High School. It happened at 7.30 this morning. Five people were shot. One person is dead. The suspect is 17 years old. T.J. Lane is now in police hands. This happened again about 7.30 this morning. Police got the call about 7.38. They were here in five minutes. We were told that the suspect then fled the school. He was chased out of the school by a teacher. He then turned himself in to two bystanders who then took him to the police department where he has been ever since. Again, an incredible day here in Chardon, a tragic day here in Chardon. Police have been here all day. They've had news conferences all day long. There is grief counseling going on this evening, and there will probably be memorials taking place tonight. There's certainly a planned memorial tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Right now, we want to go to my colleague, Kim Wheeler, who's standing by the Board of Education at the middle school. The middle school is where that grief counseling is going on. Hi, Kim. Hi, Russ. And also behind me, you can see the flag has been lowered to half staff. They did that a little while ago. The superintendent also just walked into the Board of Education a little while ago as well. Now, to set the scene for when I got here today, it's a very small community, and so there was a line of parents trying to get there to pick up their children. They were parking along side streets. They were parking wherever they could. They were walking to the school. And then we started seeing a steady stream of kids coming out with their parents arm in arm. Lots of the kids were obviously very upset, so were the parents. Now, one student that I talked to is Nate Mueller, and he was actually in the cafeteria when the shooting started. And he says that he has been friends over the past with the suspected shooter, T.J. Lane. And he says it just happened all of a sudden. There was no indication this was going to happen. They started hearing the shots from behind them. He was sitting at a table with five students. He was one of only two students who was not shot at that table although he did have a little bit of a graze wound on his ear. He says it was a 22 caliber weapon that was used. Now, he also says he then ran out of the cafeteria when he could. He hid behind cars out in the parking lot. Now, we also talked to another student. I'm hoping we have some sound that we can roll of this student, but she says that Frank Hall, who is a coach and also a teacher, started chasing after this gunman, and the gunman fired several shot shots toward him. It did miss the teacher. The teacher continued to run after the suspect and the shots continued being fired. Apparently, Frank Hall also chased him outside of the school. We are hearing that from a number of students and parents about the heroic efforts of Frank Hall. And I think we're going to hear about a lot of other heroes as well from today. We heard about janitors going into classrooms and telling kids to get down and making sure that the doors were locked. So we are going to continue hearing those stories, I'm sure. But everyone here is still really just trying to wrap their arms around what happened today and trying to make sense of it. And really, there's just no way to do that right now at all. Russ? Kim Wheeler, thank you very much. I want to show you something here. Kim talked about the flag being at half staff where she is at the Board of Education. Again, I'm at the high school. There are two flags here. You're looking at the other end of the field. That flag was just lowered to half staff as well. My colleague Eric Mansfield has been here since very early this morning. He's spoken to a number of students, and he has something for you now that has not been seen on television today. Eric? Yeah, we spoke with a number of students, of course, who witnessed it. Of course, we heard from Nate Mueller, Kim Wheeler just talked about as well, but also a young woman who was at the table right next to the shooter. And as we talk with parents and students today very much about the day that their lives changed forever. He had walked in with a gun and started shooting. And for Heather Ziska. He had no emotion on his face. He was just shooting. The world just stopped. 
I was sitting about 20 feet away from him and I just kind of got up and ran. A few tables away from the gunman, she ran for her life when the bullets rang out. He definitely looked like he was aiming the gun. It didn't look like he was just blatantly shooting. But while Heather and her mother were quickly reunited, other parents watched, waited, and prayed. Okay, if I could find my kid. I knew something was wrong. Too many calls come through in that early time in the morning. I'm like, something's wrong. It's just really hard um, because you can't do anything. You're in a helpless situation. Are you texting with your child? Yes. Any mm -hmm. good news? What are they yeah, saying? They're, they're both fine. Parents, school leaders, and police working together, calming fears, even as the shock turned to reality. Yeah, I heard people yelling, and then I heard the announcement saying that we were on lockdown. Connor Cray was locked down for 90 minutes before he was finally released to his parents. He watched the news unfold from home, reflecting on an unbelievable day. One kid that I know, he, he was shot. I know he's gotten into trouble in the past. I just didn't think that he would walk into a school and start shooting. And that is very much the sentiment so many students had that knew the shooter. They were just so surprised, Russ, that while they knew the student had troubles, they never expected this. Uh, that is something. You just got an email from someone telling you about some other information yeah, so taking place. Some of the student groups here would like the rest of the students to join them on the square at 8.30 tonight for a candlelight and prayer vigil. I know a larger vigil for the community is for tomorrow, but the student union, or rather student government, is planning on 8.30 tonight at the square. Okay, Eric Mansfield, thank you very much. As we were standing here, uh, a gentleman walked up to me. He is a parent who was here early today. He's right here. Come in, sir. Mr. Dale Jurgens. He's one of a parent. He has a student here at the school. He was one of the first parents on the scene today. And you're very emotional right now, understandably. We're on the air right now, sir. <sighs> tell me what you saw today and tell me why you think it was important for you to come down here. Well, I was sitting at home watching and I want everybody to know here in Chardon that these teachers in this facility had done a fantastic job. I mean, I got here early. The city department had their men here to not let people get close to the school because they didn't know what was going on. I was a parent that didn't know if my daughter was one of the students that were hurt. And they, they, they didn't give us information where I could understand why. I was lucky that my daughter called me and said she was safe. But the way they took us all to the cross the street to the school to pick up our children, to make sure our children were going home with us. And the teachers were in the building. Yeah. They saw it happen. Uh, they heard it, and I was impressed on how well our community took care of making sure everything was done correctly. And you've got teachers that they went through this, and they were there making sure that my child and everyone else's child got home with us safe. And you got to tell everybody out there how well our school had done for us, the parents of this community. We've been telling that. We certainly appreciate you coming down here and telling us that as well. How are you doing? How are your kids doing? My daughter, she's right now with a youth group uh, to, to, to mourn with some of these students that know really well who these people were. Uh, me as a parent, uh, I can tell you that my store is over, you know, 10 minutes away from here. When I've got that reverse 911 call saying the school is on lockdown, there was a shooting, I know I left with no coat. I left my store wide open with nobody attending it to come here. And as a parent, I through your mind, everything is going through that it, my, it was my child. Is it my child who's dead? And the people that have children that got shot or the one that had passed away, I, I, I have to triple the feeling that I had on the way here. I, 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 I can't imagine that pain that that family's going through right now. I can't imagine the pain of the family of the young man who did this. I mean, that family, I, I I reach out for that family, and and you know it's just it's horrid what happened here, sure. and I agree that somebody's you guys are on the news ten hours now straight about this, and we live in this community, and we feel I feel that yes it, it needs to be told people need to understand, but we need to learn how to reach out to these kids that hopefully no one else wants to okay. do this. Gail Jurgens, we thank you so much for coming down here. Yeah, I just want everybody to know. We're glad. We're glad you're okay, and we're glad your, your child yeah. is okay as well. Okay. Thank Thanks. you so much. Wow, that's a little bit of the emotion that you're seeing throughout this community tonight. I can tell you that the Attorney General of Ohio was here earlier today touring the, touring the scene. Mike DeWine flew here from Columbus to see what was going on here. He described the cafeteria where this took place as a murder scene. He said, quote, you can imagine what that looked like, end quote. Governor Kasich still 
the buzz is that he may make it here sometime this evening. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, through his spokesperson, Jake Carney, said today that he is having prayers for the people of Chardon and for this community. You just heard Mr. Jurgens here, an incredible story there. There are many parents, many discussions going on this evening about what happened here in Chardon, Ohio. We want to go back to Aaron and Chris in the studio. Russ, thank you very much. A lot of families going to be sitting together for dinner tonight, holding hands, maybe saying a prayer, giving thanks that at least their family is okay tonight. And amazingly, we've heard from so many amazing parents and students today. But one of the most compelling interviews of the day came from Channel 3 reporter Eric Mansfield. That's right. Eric was able to talk to one of the students who was injured, injured by the gunman's bullet. He actually had an injury to his ear. First person now, let's listen to Eric's interview. Hi, guys. This is Nate Mueller. We, we heard it shortly with him a little bit ago. And you were actually grazed by one of the bullets. Show me. Yeah, it's right here on my ear. I was, um, I was actually, as I was turning away from the gunman, he caught me right on the ear. How's your hearing? I mean, for a gun to have gone off, how close was he when he fired that shot? Um, we were the table right next to him. He was within three feet of us. And um, three of the victims were at my table as well, out of five people. So Nate, has this sunk into you yet? No, it's still pretty, it's pretty fake to me still. It all feels like a movie. It, it, tomorrow, ask me because I'm sure tomorrow I'll be devastated. Did you see the gun first or did you hear the shots? He took one shot. He didn't say anything the entire time. He took one shot and then that's when we looked to see what was happening because it sounded like a firecracker almost. And um, at that point, I looked back, I saw him shoot, that which hit one of my other friends that was sitting at the table with us. Mm -hmm. And then as I was turning around to run, that's when he hit me. Okay. And then I had left. All right, so, Nate, you're at the table. How many kids are at the table? Five. Four, four at the table, including me, and then one standing next to the table. And did the gunman just walk in or had been he had at been the table? He had been sitting at the table behind us after everybody left that I assume he was sitting with and gone to class. And we were just talking like a normal day. And then we heard the first shot, and that's when it all started. Why are you still alive? I don't know. <laughs> I I got lucky. I have somebody looking over me, I guess. What do you know about, the, without giving out his name, what do you know about this suspect? Did you know this kid at all? I was actually friends with him up until eighth grade, and he kind of got into the gothic phase and kind of silenced himself from his friends. But, I mean, he still had friends. He was still a nice kid. Like, he, we... I don't think anybody really ever expected it to be him, you know? Like, we didn't think he would hurt anybody. So after you're wounded, you have other friends who are, are wounded because you got grazed. Where do you go? How do you get out of the situation? Um, as I, I saw my friends all just, it was almost tunnel vision. Like, I could see pictures just putting them together in my head because I was in such panic. And I uh, left the cafeteria and I went out the front doors and hid in between some cars and called the police. And then after that, I'd met up with some of my other friends that I'd got out. And uh, we were sent down to the middle school. And then where did the gunman go? Because we understand a teacher may have been involved in getting them out of there. Um, what I heard is he had left the cafeteria and went into a different classroom and then shot again. But I was out of the school before he left, so I can't answer that. Where do you go from here? keep going go to the hospital check on all my friends make sure everybody's okay yeah come will you come back to school tomorrow if it's open of course <laughs> you're not worried no i think it's, it's past how many shots were fired do you know um i know he had a revolver so it couldn't have been more than six but i know i heard three or four so and the shot that went past you did come from the front did come from the rear it came from the back all shots were from behind us coming towards us. Nate, I, I'm almost sure that you've survived some. Father is here as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you get a hold? We'll talk to him in a second. How did you get a hold of your parents to let them know you were okay? Um, after I called the police, I called my mom and I told them, and that was actually um, one of the last calls that anybody was really going to get to make for the next hour. 
because I mean after this everybody was using their phones, texting, nothing was going through. I mean we we weren't getting messages, we couldn't make fall or phone calls. Uh, service towers were just overworked, I would imagine. What can we do to help you? Have you been through this, and, and your other friends and the rest of the, the kids here at the school, what can everybody do to help you guys right now? Just pray, I guess. Just hope for us. Just don't let it happen again either. A lot of prayers coming his way tonight. That was Eric Mansfield from much earlier in the day speaking with Nate Mueller, who was one of the students who was in the cafeteria with the shooter. He was shot, a bullet grazed his ear. At that point when we were hearing that interview from Eric, we didn't know that it was a fatal shooting. Sadly, five people mm -hmm. were shot. We know now that one student has passed away. And in one real way, he was a sixth victim, physically injured by the gunman's bullet. 16-year-old dealt one of life's very adult realities very quickly. Let's go back out to the east side. Channel 3's Russ Mitchell continuing our coverage. Russ, what do you have? Uh, Chris and Aaron, uh, thank you very much. I want to go right, go right now to uh, Tom Meyer. Tom is at the grandparents' home of the suspect, uh, T.J. Lane. Tom, what can you tell us? Hey, Russ, this is a lonely country road right now, but earlier today, a beehive of activity with 50 law enforcement officers coming here with a search warrant to search this 40-acre estate that's owned by T.J. Lane's grandparents. Uh, we're not sure if they found anything. I did speak to a couple neighbors, and both, both neighbors had were shocked but had very nice things to say about the grandparents and about T.J. They like to you know, back to nature, grow their vegetables. Um, there's target practicing, which several of the neighbors around here do. I don't, but, you know, we do hear target practicing. I've never been hit so hard with something happening like this with the good friends and neighbors. It really bothers me because, because they're good people, you know. And I have a lot of friends in the community. I've been here 56 years. What do you know about TJ? Very nice young man. Talked to me when he went up and down the road. Well, he lived a thousand feet from the house here. And uh, he'd go up and down the road, wave at me, talk to me. Now one officer told now now one officer told me that TJ Lane hung out with uh, somebody that was kind of a household name with police. He says that wasn't the case with TJ. Uh, we did some checking. We found no prior convictions for uh, drug use or any kind of uh, uh, drug charges. Um, very, sh very shocking feeling out here among neighbors for us. Radio dispatch teams. Okay. As I speak right now, authorities remain in the high school. They'll be here all night, also through tomorrow and in the days that follow. We were just told a few moments ago by a police officer that we, the news media, now have to leave this scene as they kind of widen their investigation. So I'm going to sign off from here now. But want to remind folks at home, at the bottom of the hour at 630, we'll be going to the NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. And they have a story on what happened here today told from a different perspective. We'll be back on the air at 7 o'clock to 730 and stay with us at 10 o'clock for a 90-minute edition of Channel 3 News at 11. But tonight, it starts at 10. We'll be on the air from 10 o'clock to 11.35. That's all coming up. To Chris and Aaron, my colleagues in the studio, let me say I know you guys have been on the air since 4.30 this morning. You've been telling this very important story since it broke just after 7.30 today. You two have done a fantastic job. Hats off to you as well. I appreciate it. The whole city of Cleveland, this whole area appreciates it. Just wanted you to know that. Russ, Thank thanks. You, Russ. That means very much. And I know that this is still an evolving story as testament by you having to move locations. This is still fluid more than 10 hours in to coverage of this story. The most recent news conference that we had was at 4 o'clock. We heard from the Geauga County Sheriff. We heard from local police officers, grief counselors. And what they said at that news conference was even though there were 911 calls coming from students and teachers who were inside the building, they have chosen that they're not going to be releasing those tapes right now. But we do know that they have released and made public radio dispatch tapes from immediately after the shooting. Here it is. Station Shard, what do you have? Give me all available to the man to the station. Shard, we have three students down in the cafeteria at this time. We still don't know where the shooter is. Also, there's a fourth one down in room 200. They're requesting assistance as soon as possible. I know you're doing what you can. Shard, the squad, you can go on in for 201. 5-7, move your crew inside the cafeteria. 
Thanks to the Manpower page, all available manpower to the station. All available manpower to your station. That means four helicopters landing at Walmart. Four helicopters at Walmart. Okay, we're on we're on the line with helicopters right now. Room two hundred. One victim, two shots. The second victim in the cafeteria handled. Go ahead. Metro flights coming, one ETA five minutes, the other 17 minutes. Thank you. I've got one leaving the scene now, headed to Walmart. We've got every patient they found being loaded and getting on uh, ambulances. They're checking the three more hallways for more victims. We'll let you know where we need the next squad. 4056, transporting patient to landing zone. We're right at Walmart. Who's the first arriving helicopter? Six, be advised we are at the landing zone with one patient. At this time, all patients are out of the building that we know of. And as you can hear, very well organized this morning EMTs. That first phone call came in at about 738. Everybody has said, including Dan McClellan with the Geauga County Sheriff's Department, that everyone was well prepared. The response time was very quick, very rapid. Law enforcement was quickly inside that school and quickly moving all the victims outside of the school. So as that continues on many fronts, on a more personal level, families are trying to figure out how to talk about all of this with their young people, whether they're in Chardon or whether they're in Ashtabula or whether they're in Sandusky. How communities heal in these hours that follow, so critical. Channel 3's Jim Donovan live in Chardon now with a little bit about how the community is turning ways to heal. Hi, Jimmy. Hello, Chris and Aaron, and you're right, Chris, uh, to describe it as families because as the people arrive here at the middle school, which is the center right now where some of that grief counseling is going on and will go on until about 7 o'clock tonight, they are arriving as families. I mean, children are arriving with one parent or two parents, but it is as a group. They are arriving as families, and there will be plenty of opportunities for more of that in the upcoming days weeks and time beyond that too but specifically in the near future here's what happens this continues until seven o'clock tonight here at the middle school and then starts up again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m once again here at the middle school with grief counselors on hand to talk to people we showed you pet therapy dogs were also here maybe to make people just feel a little bit better about the shocking events that went on today and then tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock right across from the right across the street from where we are stationed here at the Board of Education at St. Mary Church at 4 o'clock. Before there is a vigil in the evening, there will be more available opportunities for people to seek some grief counseling. In that 4 o'clock press conference, and you talked about the law officials that were on hand and talking about the things that they could talk about and the things that they weren't going to talk about, the superintendent of schools then released the information that schools will be closed tomorrow in Chardon and that he also advised his faculty and staff, except for about maybe five of the janitors the area that need to be around the building if the officials continue to need to be inside that building to investigate what is a crime scene right now but he advised them to take the day off too and then i think he said the most poignant and personal remarks that even he could come up with on such a day and that was for his staff to go hug your own child because it's very important and i hope every parent if you haven't hugged or kissed your kid in the last couple of days you take that time and so those teachers that acted so professionally and so proficiently in those critical hours this morning, uh, I'm sure they are feeling it now too, is that adrenaline rush and then getting home and being with their own family, and then it will hit them what they actually went through. How hard it will hit them, only they'll be able to speak about that with their families, and of course the opportunities to talk to someone professionally will come up, and they advise that it could take a lot of time. So that's it here from the Board of Education right now and what is going on, but families Chris and Aaron are taking the opportunity to take upon them the chance to come in and talk to people about what happened here today. Absolutely. Jimmy, we'll see you back there at the top of the hour at 7 p.m. with our continuing coverage then. But as he said, exhaustion probably setting in now Absolutely. 11 hours after the fact. And even though school is closed tomorrow, again, the grief counselors are there, but people coming together in many different forms right now, especially their local houses of worship. Robin Swoboda is standing by at a local church. Robin, I'm sure that a lot of people, they're gonna rely on their faith during this time right now, trying to make sense of something that just doesn't make sense to anybody.
That's exactly right, Aaron and Chris. Uh, we're about 20, 25 minutes into a prayer vigil here at the Assembly of God Church here in Chardon. And it began with Pastor Jeff Johnson, who said uh, he, he described it so well that he said this morning began like any other day. He was at a car dealership uh, waiting for a car repair when he got a phone call that said, uh, did you hear what happened? He went on to say that uh, word traveled so fast that his son, who is on the USS Carl Vincent in the Persian Gulf, called his dad, knowing that he worked with uh, teenagers, youth groups here in Chardon. He began the service uh, telling everyone, reminding them that uh, God is their strength and refuge in times like these, and that this prayer vigil, along with many others that are happening around the Chardon area and different communities, are here to remind people that God is there even when he seems like he's not, that they want to be a support, they want to lend a hand, they want to lend a comforting word and a shoulder to cry on, because many people don't have families to turn to, and that is when the church becomes your family. This will go on till 8 o'clock tonight, six uh, different speakers, uh, each providing their own perspective, and uh, it's just been um, heartbreaking to see that people stream in with, uh, with tears and hugs and just looking for hope. And Robin, didn't you indicate that one of the young men who was injured today belongs to that church and goes there? Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you for reminding me of that, Chris. Yes, uh, one of the uh, young men who's at Metro Health uh, was here last week as part of the youth service, um, youth group that meets here every Wednesday night. We also heard from the pastor's daughter earlier who said that T.J. Lane, the shooter, had been here on a number of occasions, uh, that she personally drove him home and was shocked to find out that he was indeed the uh, the man, uh, young man accused of doing these uh, heinous shootings today. Absolutely. Well, it There's a lot to going on here, a lot of emotion. I can imagine so. And it's exhausting for everybody there, Robin, and it tells you how tightly knit that community is. Robin, thanks very much. We'll come back to the top that's, of the hour at 7 right. o'clock with you and Jimmy. Now, this morning, a distraught parent called in and shared with, Ra with Aaron and I a text that she received from her son who was locked in that school. We have that tape for you. This is from 11 hours ago. Let's listen. Nick's text said, oh, and there's another one, I think, yeah. Um, Take your time. Uh, this came in at 7.51. We are still okay. We haven't heard any more shots. And we moved a piano in front of the door. We are okay. I love you. And now at 8.02, he put, we are still okay. That has to make a mother feel worth a million dollars. That I one just text. want him home. Chris, I don't know about you, but that was to me one of the most emotionally wrenching of many moments that we've had this morning. Mm -hmm. Cam Schuler didn't know whether her son was okay. He was in the cafeteria, which is where some of the first shots were fired. She told us, you know, that he had texted her saying that they had pushed a piano against the door trying to make sure that the gunman couldn't come back in. You know, so many parents, unfortunately, hearing um, about this news from texts from their children. Maybe that's good news, maybe it's bad news. We knew that you know they were okay, but they had no right. idea what was going on. Well, that was also the time, as you hit it right on the head, there was so much ambiguity. There was no confirmation of anything. How many shooters were there? How many victims were there? We simply didn't know. As the day has now progressed, those numbers have firmed up. Five victims in today's senseless shooting. We have a photo that we'd like to show you that's of Daniel Parmeter, the young man who died as a result of this shooting. That is him right there. Four other students, friends of his, who were shot are still in the hospital at this hour at Hillcrest and Metro Hospital in varying conditions. Two boys and one girl. Conditions will be updated here as they come into the newsroom. And of course, we have been on air with this since 740 this morning. We are going to stay on air as long as necessary until, you know, this coverage starts, you know, kind of fleshing out. But we do have some programming notes that we want to pass on. The Voice will be on at 9 p.m. as scheduled. And also, we are going to begin extended coverage starting at 10 p.m. That's going to be an hour and a half of news. We're going to take that through our 11 o'clock newscast as well. So please tune in with us at 10 o'clock. Our reporters are out on the scene right now gathering new information. We'll have a lot of new developments and hopefully some good news to share with you at 10 o'clock tonight. And in this day began, we did not know the names T.J. Lane or Frank Hall or Daniel Parmeter. Tonight, we know them all too well. We don't know the conditions of four young people in Northeast Ohio hospitals that are fighting for their life. Uh, we learned the story of a football teacher, a football coach who was watching a study hall breakfast this morning, who stepped into action and may have saved a number of lives, 
by shooing the gunman out of the building who was then apprehended a short time later and taken into custody where he remains tonight inside the Geauga County and Jail. And I think as the story develops, we're going to hear a lot more really heroic stories of people like Coach Frank Hall, mm -hmm. the EMTs who arrived on scene, janitors who were going from classroom to classroom to make sure that the students who were inside were okay. We had reports of students who had locked themselves inside closets, inside labs, not knowing what was going on, but adults coming by and, and letting them know exactly what they needed to do, putting themselves in harm's way to make sure that these students were safe. Absolutely. It's the changing world we live in here in Northeast Ohio. As the world now focuses on Chardon, NBC Nightly News will bring you coverage and we'll let you know how the country is viewing our story. Again, the news continues at 7, an expanded coverage of the news tonight beginning at 10 p.m. For Aaron Kennedy and all of us at Channel 3, I'm Chris Ty. We'll see you back here at 7 o'clock.